Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day four um, of our AI house here at Davos. Uh, on day four, you know, we get to discuss a little bit the frontier of AI, right? Um, kind of what's coming out in the next horizon for AI. So I want to start first by thanking everyone, each one of you, for joining us this morning for our session. Um, I'd like to thank our amazing panel um, for joining this, uh, what I think will be an amazing and hopefully very audience participatory and interactive conversation. Um, so let me first introduce the topic before I introduce the panelists and um, we start grilling them with some interesting questions. Um, the topic of today, Frontier of AI, it's about intelligence um, on the edge of compute. It's about uh, um, a world where we're not creating AI much like a lot of the things that have been talked about all week based on, call it, historical pre-trained digital data in the internet. But instead, uh, intelligence on the edge of compute, it's about the world of sensors. Um, and it's about you know, creating intelligence that emerges um, from real-time, uh, live sensor data that really focuses on capturing the essence of the world. And you know, if you're a machine thinking about essence of the world, much like our title suggests, um, that usually is a quest of teaching AI how to understand people, how to understand places, and how to understand things. So that's the context of our panel today to kind of set up the right baseline. Um, and with that, let me introduce um, our amazing panel. They're all AI practitioners, um, so they'll bring a very interesting perspective to this conversation. Um, our first panelist is Nicole, um, who's the founder and CEO of um, Meantrix, Merentix, uh, I'm sorry. Um, then we have Gabe, who's the founder and CEO of Versus. And finally, we have Prashant, um, who's the vice president of research and development um, at Bayanat. So to get us started, uh, my dear friend panelists, um, I wonder if you can uh, briefly introduce a little bit the topic of what you do and what uh, your company does. And if we can start with you, Nicole. Sure, and thank you. And um, I hope you all saw the launch of what uh, Alex is doing. It's uh, really amazing thank um, you. With, your, with your company, Analog. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so at um, Morantix, we're very focused on driving the adoption of AI. And for us, that means different things. So with Morantix, we basically invest and we build new ventures and category leaders in different fields, very B2B, deep tech focused. And with Morantix Momentum, the company I founded, we're sort of helping existing organizations on this journey to understand how to utilize this. And then we have an ecosystem organization, the campus, which we're now also found as some, as some embodiment here in the AI house, which basically connects the dots and connects different players and perspectives. Physically in Berlin, it's also a virtual community. And now it's on wheels in Davos and who knows where else soon. Gabe? Thank you for having me here today. This is truly an honor. It's our first time at Davos and I uh, appreciate uh, you attending this morning. Um, Versus is a cognitive computing company as opposed to an artificial intelligence company. Our main focus is not to try to artificially engineer intelligence in a computer, but rather to take the best of what we understand about biology, physics, and neuroscience, and apply that to computing, distributed computing, which we believe will be driven by the edge, and fundamentally building a fabric based on science and standards to connect people, places, and things uh, to enable this new digital infrastructure for the 21st century. Cool, Prashant? Thanks for having me, Alex. You know, this is a very interesting session and a very interesting topic. Um, Bayanath uh, is a geospatial company. It's the oldest geospatial company in the UAE. We started with mapping and surveying type of things. Now, over the last few years, we are heavily invested in geospatial AI. So now, as Space 42, we are also going to have our own satellites in space in the next few years, a lo lot of satellites. We call ourselves, you know, like, uh, with remote sensing, we call ourselves the original big data problem. That's, uh, we were dealing with gigabytes of data, uh, even several decades ago, dealing with image processing of those data that is collected from satellites and so on. 
So with that, with that uh, general background, what we are trying to do now is develop this very interactive, highly user-centric geospatial AI platforms that provide the insights, not just the data that was flowing into that thing, all the terabytes of data flowing in on a day-to-day -day basis are converted into insights for uh, specific applications. You know, it's, it's a wide range of applications you can, you can do with satellite data. But then we're also interested in actually embedding the concept of location, which is the common denominator of people, places, and things into that domain and come up with a data fusion of multiple data sets in one place. That's amazing. Thank, thank you all for sharing. For the next question I want to ask each of you, you know, as AI practitioners, put that hat on. Um, teleport yourself with me 10 years in the future, since we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, the horizon for AI and AI frontiers. Let's bring ourselves to, I don't know, 2035. And, you know, give me your perspective on, you know, it's 2035. How has the world changed by 2035 in terms of the way that people interact with other people, with places, when with things based on, you know, um, all this AI that we get to create together over the next decade? Mm -hmm. We'll start with you, Nicole. Sure. Um, so I, um, I mean, I kind of always have to think of... Um, Plato's cave, right, when I think of sort of the digital world, because, you know, AI systems are trained on data that's visible in the digital world for now, right? And um, and Plato's cave, right, is this image of, like, the real world is, is just projected as a shadow into a cave, and kind of that's how AI systems sometimes feel, right, because it's limited to something that you can project into the digital space. So as we are advancing with sensors and um, capturing more of the analog world in the digital space, I also anticipate we can sort of understand this world a bit better. Not sure we're gonna climb out of the cave completely, but maybe that shadow will become a bit more interesting and nuanced. And I think um, I'm very excited about that because there are a lot of things we don't know about the world and we don't know even about ourselves, right? And we think, I mean, you're human cognition. There's like, I have the feeling we know like 5%, just like space, <laughs> maybe max, no? <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I, I think it's just going to be a very interesting, very augmenting exponential journey of learning. And that, I think that's very exciting. And I mean, now we can you know, talk use cases you know, on, on cognition, on space, on public health, on you know, all those kind of things. But I think the interaction will be more seamless, and I think we'll gain more understanding. That makes me optimistic and very excited. That's very cool. Gabe? Well, I think the lens that, that I look through is, is the lens of the convergence of all of these technologies. So you have artificial intelligence or intelligent agents that are kind of the new logic layer. Those replace the apps of today. You have a new immersive interfaces that re replace the, the screens of today. And you have data that is structured in such a such way that, that AI can understand us and we can understand their decision-making process. So what you want is the benefit of these technologies so where they're hyper-efficient, therefore sustainable, not the sort of massive data centers, you know, powering the small power of a sun to try to keep some AI powered, but rather many, many billions of small agents at the edge that really make up the new web. I mean, the third version of the web here will be this combination of the technologies that we spend all our time talking about. Spatial computing, augmented and virtual reality as the interface, AR, uh, you know, uh, IA, uh, AI and, and IA, so uh, intelligent agents, artificial intelligence and new kinds of ways of dealing with data, including things like blockchains and digital currencies. And this kind of becomes the sci-fi future that we've all seen in movies and, and stories. What we want, though, in this 2035 year is a, a version of the future, which we need to start envisioning, that's not about the technology, but how that technology augments our capabilities. How does it make us smarter? Right? How does it make the world safer? and more sustainable. So I think it is that sci-fi future, but we've yet to dream the dream of what a good future with great technology looks like. So I think that that's what these types of conversations are about. And um, uh, that's the world that I see in the future. I want to live in that Star Trek future. <laughs> uh, Prashant? I'll just add um, very good points. No, it's like just, just to add that, you know, it's like, I, I, I think you know, it's, it's, it will be more of intricate communication between technology and us as humans in a context-aware and history-informed decision-making process. 
So these, these buzzwords basically uh, are very, very important, you know. Right now we are not there. And I think when you're talking about 2035, I hope we'll be there because there is data flowing in now with all those sensors coming in from all, from the bottom of the ocean to, the, to, the, to space and all those things. So having awareness of context and a bit of knowledge from history the time series uh, will make it much more intricate communication between the technology and humans. That's, that's what uh, will happen. That's exciting. So I want to live in the future that you guys paint. Um, so for the next little bit, let's try to talk a little bit about the journey of what it takes to actually go from here to there. Um, since this can you know, impact entire communities and um, goes across pretty much every industry, I just want to pick one. I want to pick one and I want to pull a thread across different aspects of that thread with each of you so that we can kind of see as creators, each one of you, you know, um, amazing creators in your domains, um, and pull that thread. I want to pick, you know, um, smart cities as the example. Um, and uh, the first question is for you, Nicole. Um, you know, you as a practitioner of AI um, have shipped um, quite a lot of, you know, both AI and machine learning in the past. I wonder, you know, again, you know, if you think about in the context of smart cities, on the journey of going from here to our Star Trek future 10 years from now, if you can share with, with folks in the audience some insights on how we can, as creators, create this future f with a thought um, on how we get to maximum societal and community impact. So um, I'm going to start with the, with the yucky stuff. <laughs> Yesterday we had a panel here and we were talking about the big models and sort of uh, different layers in between. But then we, we realized that the actual way to get there, there's a lot of yucky stuff. So it's about the nitty gritty of data, collection, curation, engineering. It's about, you know, compliance, about figuring out who has access to this data, about figuring out where it's actually deployed. So it's, it, it was all the stuff where, like, okay, we have all this amazing technology, but there's this yucky stuff we kind of have to figure out in between, right? And it was, it was kind of funny. Um, there's also, by the way, some of the yucky stuff is also very human, <laughs> because we also need to get used to new ways of interacting with technology and need to build trust, right? So that's some of, the, some of that, um, I'd say, difficult, you know, friction stuff that we're... That, you know, we, maybe slows down also the speed. So one example, I, um, I basically um, um, wrote a concept for the German government on a data institute. A data institute is about you know, sharing data between public, private sector, between, uh, between academia and, and other spheres to exactly enable use cases like smart city or public health use cases. And, and there, I would say, um, like coming from, let's say, a, a legacy country of like where a lot of the systems are already in place, I think we have a long way to go to actually just get the data ready and get you know, sensors in place and get consensus also on what do we want to do in the public sphere. I would say that's, that's, that's like a very, very big, and just figuring out what is the data that's being collected. It sounds very mundane, right? But just even just the data audit and the data catalog to understand what can we work with um, in a country like Germany today is still a challenge. And you know, for many, my other half is Jamaican. And uh, now Jamaican is maybe not the digital champion, but there are many other countries here that are maybe not the most or are more emerging. And I, I think they can leapfrog maybe potentially a lot of this, these issues that we have in um, yeah, countries like Germany. So I think maybe some of the yucky stuff there is easier because <laughs> you don't have to deal with, with legacy. But I would say um, we need to deal with some of this because these guys are building amazing tech, which once we figure this out, we can just basically um, scale a lot. And it, it has a lot to do, I would say, also with kind of stakeholder communication, especially in the context of smart city where people are moving around and, I mean, living their lives, right? And I feel that's a very, very important part, and that's also something we focused a lot on in this paper for this data institute. We need to get stakeholders on board and get their buy-in and get them excited about this, and that, that will be very important. So I want to build a little bit um, on what you just said, and I couldn't possibly agree more with what you're saying. And um, on, in so much of the conversation, I think this week has turned to, um, you know, potentially AI being scary. Um, and one way to deal with AI being scary is regulating all this yucky stuff that you talk about. Um, I want to shift that conversation a little bit, and you know, I guess Gabe a question. Um, on that topic, and in the context of smart city, building on what you just said, Nicole, and second, what is the role of you know 
regulation is already difficult when you think about you know, single companies with large singular models in single countries. And what we're talking about in this context is, you know, millions to potential billions of sensors all talking to each other. So what do you think, um, and can you talk to us a little bit about the role of governance in this world and the difference between governance and regulations? Um, and in that same topic, if you're going to govern anything, if you could also, you know, talk to us a little bit about, you know, the role of instead of having black box AI, um, having white box AI where these things can almost be auditable, where you can query them and, you know, essentially understand why is it that you got to this set of responses, which I think is necessary in the world of having millions of these things, you know, potentially collecting data in a, it's in a smart city construct. Yeah, I think we all have two feelings when we try to imagine this future with 100 billion sensors out there. The first one, when you, we just do a little bit of forecasting, is okay, everything that can be tracked will be tracked. And then you think, well, that's a, that sounds horrible. Why would I want that? I don't want that. And we, we have this, you know, re repulsion. As much as we're attracted to these technologies, we imagine these, you know, amazing utopian scenarios, how personalized healthcare or how to tackle planet scale problems, things beyond the limits of our cognition and even beyond the, the ability of our collective cognition. That's, that's why we come to places like this is to learn from each other and to talk to each other and to, to imagine new futures. But the more capability we give these systems, the more autonomy we give them, um, w w by, by this I mean the ability to do things without us needing to figure it out, which is what we want. I don't want to tell my autonomous car, stop, make a left, drive, you know. I want it to be autonomous. If you take that and extrapolate that to all of the smart things in the world, right? So we've got smartphones, smart, smart devices, smart homes, smart cars. We want smart buildings, smart hospitals, smart cities. How do you make all these smart things work together if everyone's going to build their own smart way to do it? Right? And it turns out, with the last 30 years of technology, we have developed interoperability for communication between data systems. But we have not developed uh, interoperability for the data itself. Everyone's got their own format, schema, style, uh, and, and, and anyone who, who's ever tried to stick two pieces of data, like sensor data and spatial information with legacy data, knows that this is, this is the problem. So what is the solution today? Make a magic box, use deep learning, get as many NVIDIA computers as possible, um, get $100 million, and crank the thing for four or five months, and hopefully some answers will pop out. What are the answers? How did it arrive at those answers? Eh, black box, we don't know. So, but we don't want to put autonomous agents into the world that will be 10 times more than the total number of humans operating every device and every environment in our homes, in our schools, in our streets, in our bodies, without the ability to not just have deep learning, but to have deep understanding. That means that they need to understand us, the data that we produce. You said data fusion. Sensor fusion, data fusion, these are terms you may not think of very much. You, you, you are one of the world's experts on this topic. I am building the, the HoloLens. But today, as you're sitting in this room, you're fusing all this different data together. You're sensing the temperature of the room, your eyes are seeing us on the stage, you're hearing my voice, and you can produce this full simulation in your brain, full three-dimensional model. We need the ability to produce this in these systems. So we've been working with the IEEE, who standardized Wi-Fi and Ethernet and Bluetooth and things that we rely on today to enable a new global standard for data interoperability that enables spatial information, physical data from sensors, um, historical data to basically be fused together in any way, like Lego pieces, in a completely explicit and explainable model, much like we did for the World Wide Web, like we've done for other protocols, but now to allow the data to be combined, to be auditable, to be permissionable, and this is the kind of digital infrastructure fabric upon which we can enable then intelligence at the edge with enabling agents that are law-abiding, right? That can understand our ethics and our, our values. And so I think that this is the, the shift that we have to move towards. We have to think of this as a new global network, the third version of the web, and we need to build out that data infrastructure that enables um, all the benefits that we want in these, these smart cities of the future where at the very least, all these smart things should work together.
That makes sense. So I want to keep building on this, Prashant, um, on you. So still in this concept of smart cities, you know, they talked about the yuckiness and the complexity and, you know, how hard it is to do all of this. And you are, you know, the vice president of research and development at Bionat. So, you know, my question for you, because you're the guy that has to take all of this and actually, you know, ship it to customers. Yeah. Um, how do you and your team, um, you know, balance all of this complexity and all this yuckiness and ultimately yield what I'll say accessible, um, approachable, you know, simple human experiences on the other end. Yeah, the two sides of it, you know, first on the anal analytics side, no? It's about finding what we are trying to do, you know, what is that objective function we are trying to achieve for all these AI models to come and help us in a way, you know? In the end, if you just take it at the abstract level, what are we trying to do, you know? You're putting all that sensors everywhere, data coming from multiple sources, you're collecting so much of your own information with those, all those smart things, and so on. In the end, what are we trying to answer? The questions like, what is happening there? How is that going to affect me here? Or what is that happening around me that is affecting me? How should I be prepared for something that's going to happen? And all the, these are the types of questions we're asking. Right? These are very, very abstract questions. Now, if you dig down to that level and then start posing user journeys, Okay, so once you have a user journey of now, for me, like navigation is a very good example, going from point A to point B, right? What is the other information? So on a map, you can just get a road network and you draw point A to point B, you can go like this. But then where is the smartness coming? There is data that is coming from sensors, which is telling, look, on this road here, there is traffic. Now, it might take longer. You are predicting something there. You know, with this traffic, you are actually going to take longer to get to point B. Why don't you take point uh, route C, which will take you from another point slightly longer, but it will save your time. Now you are helping, and the decision is still on me. You know, if I have to choose this or that, because if I, if I want minimal distance, I'll do that only. Stay in traffic for a bit more, but. Uh, if I'm using a Tesla and if I don't have sufficient charge, I have to do that probably in a way. But if I know that you know, I can save time, I'll just click it there and then follow a dif different route, right? This is the purpose we are talking about. You know? It's like getting this, all this data in a model which solves the purpose of why it is being there, basically why it is being collected. That's the main intention. So that's why user journeys, user questions are, are very, very important for us you know, in putting that. And that's why I said no, I, I like representing everything in, on a geospatial front end because the concept of here, there, and all those things are represented in that common denominator in a geospatial domain. And it's also a beautiful place we can, where we can display time series. Can, can I just pick up on that? So the, the idea of geospatial we're all quite familiar with. We've all got GPS you know, navigators in our phones. In, in the world that you're talking about, the world that analog is building, that, that, that versus the Marantics, and, and, and are we calling it Space 42? Yes. No? <laughs> yeah, about to be Space 42, um, is what we call hyperspatial. What do I mean by that? I mean, instead of just physical dimensions, other dimensions of your life are factored into that journey from point A to point B. So yes, yeah, so maybe the fastest path is most important. And we've all seen when we turn on traffic and we turn off the traffic layer, and we get an intelligent sort of capability to route us. But what if you said, well, I want the scenic route, or by the way, it's my, it's my, um, I, I want to pick up a toy for my kid on the way home, figure out which, which the best route to do that. What if I want to, you know, cruise by my ex-girlfriend's house just to just old memories? Or I just want to finish the, <laughs> I just, you, what, you've never done it? Um, or, or just finish the song that I'm listening to. So sometimes it's about efficiency and productivity. But if you move into from geospatial to hyperspatial, context awareness, as you said, well, some of the context is traffic. Some of the context is, you know, like I can't get over, I, I'm married, this is just a random story, I'm just bringing, <laughs> you know. Whatever those other personal reasons are, you're gonna need agents that are your personal agent that are guiding that process using data from public information, real-time data from sensors, your historical data, your emotional state, you're hungry, right? 
And so if you start to think of these infinite number of layers that suddenly get turned off and on by these intelligent agents from the future, you are doing this data fusion, sensor fusion. But as long as you have interoperability at that infrastructure layer, all of a sudden, you really do get that very cool sci-fi future that we want. And if we can do it in ways where we get to permission and control that data, data sovereignty, and this is the new property rights that we need to be fighting for, then that becomes valuable for everybody. And then collective things that we can learn together and share enable this type of collective computing you were talking about upstairs. And I think that the, the idea of starting from a map and adding these infinite layers is a very easy way to start to imagine that future, where some of those layers you maybe you know, are on a screen, but some of them start to be projected into the environment in front of you. So this is a very cool idea that I think starts with geo and grows up from there. Yeah, m more than that, you know, it's also about displaying things in the right way as well, right? Now it's like I have this very interesting question I pose to my team. Now it's like if I have eight dimensions of data, how would you display on a single plot, right? If it's a time series in a data, basically. You know, we came up with some very nice intuitive ways of doing things. You now imagine doing a spiral. It's a time series, and then the, the, uh, the radius of each circle is one dimension to second dimension. The thickness of that line is the third dimension. The color on the line is the fourth dimension. Now, ev along that line, basically, you add a bar chart, which can add another four dimensions. So interact, and then it's a very interactive plot where you can, track, uh, you can go through. And if you put that at multiple locations, now you're adding another dimension to that. So you, you see you know, how, how you can position all this information in a place where it becomes interactive as well as gives that information to the, in the right way. So these type of things will come into the picture as more and more data comes into the picture as well. And in the end, what, what the end user wants is not all the data fashion, right? You know, it's, it's about the right answer to his question. And if those things are giving you the right answers to the questions, then uh, we are on the right path. That makes sense. Um, so we're on our journey to you know, get to our Star Trek future 10 years from now. Uh, we've talked a little bit about, I appreciate it, with your creator hats, some of the complexities and opportunities uh, to get there. I want to flip the question and you know, have you put on your leader hats on now and as you know, leaders of your corporations, um, practicing AI in very different corners of, of the earth. You, know, you um, practice primarily here in Europe. Uh, Gabe, you primarily in North America. And you know, Prashant, you primarily in the Middle East. Everybody's global. Everybody has a global proof print, but you're bringing that perspective to the conversation. And in the world, words of Spider-Man, you know, with great power comes great response. Responsibility. Um, so I'd love to hear your uh, perspectives on how you as a leader in AI are, are working with your organizations and your ecosystems um, to apply ethics um, to this conversation and what kind of you know, ethical um, conversations you are having as you're creating this you know, Star Trek future that we're chatting about. And we'll start again with you, Nicole. Yeah, so I think it has different, it has different aspects, right? Um, it is, I mean, the, 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 the question of ethics is, is very complex, right? Because even if you're just discussing it in your family is already quite interesting. In, in discussing it in your organization, right? Um, finding a common denominator is, is already complex. And then, you know, doing this in, in a country or geography and then potentially multiple ones is, is quite interesting to find sort of common values and we'll see if we if we kind of figure this out. So um, I would say, I mean, as a company, we try to, um, we don't really believe in like sort of checklists. So we we just, it's it's just hard, like we're never done. So I would say it's it's kind of always a process. And obviously we have like, we've, we have a method to the process, but it's basically an ongoing process and that makes it um, uncomfortable. But I, I, I figure that's like the only way we can do it because we don't feel comfortable like doing doing anything easier than that on lists. Then um, when we talk to and we, we try to keep ourselves accountable also through the ecosystem, right? That's kind of one way of also making our decisions and perspectives more robust to kind of because we also have blind spots, as you say. We're like based in Berlin, you know, very like Europe centric, etc. So I think that's that's another aspect. And then um, I mean. What, what we're trying to do, I mean, to be quite honest, in, in, in Europe, we're having this discussion, and I feel for technology, I'm, at the moment, I'm kind of at ease also, at some, because we're having this discussion very proactively, right? When I look back to social media, I think we kind of wish we had this discussion, ten, like, earlier, I would say. In the, in the case of AI, I feel, 
I mean, there's always more to be done, but we're having this discussion there, you know, regulators looking at it, we have an EO, we have an UAI Act, so there are different, we're kind of on, let's say, on top of things, right? We're, we're asking the right questions. If we'll find the right answers, they're, they're complex, so that's something. So I think um, one, one of the things is kind of trying to, trying to speak to people from a technology perspective, right, to regulators, for example, because it's really hard for them to then put this into regulation and, and principles that are, that are there for all of us. And then, I mean, this is a task we, we have to then make this work across geographies because as a builder, we ideally, right, have sort of rules or principles that we can apply scalably. <laughs> and I think that's at the moment sort of our biggest concern or like our biggest concern, a big concern to, to find these common, this, a common denominator that still makes sense, but that can also scale well, so we don't have a super fragmented world. So, you know, EU regulation is better than national regulation, <laughs> or even state level regulation that we're seeing pop up, right, in different, in different um, nuances. So I think talking, be open, hold yourself accountable, always question yourself, and yeah, tr try to listen to, you know, what are other people saying. That sounds amazing. Thank you. Uh, Gabe? Um, how many people in this room feel that the person right next to you has 100% the exact same ethics as you? Please raise your hand. <laughs> or with your spouse <laughs> or best friend. What are we doing when we try to pull down all the data from the web, which represents, I don't know, maybe at best a single digit number of the data that's relevant on the web, meaning most of the data is yours. It's behind a password, it's behind a login, it's your company's data, it's your personal data. Chat GPT or G GPT 2, 3, 4, 5, all the rest did not train on that data. They trained on single digit percentage. And yet, what are we getting out of that? The average ethics in a blender. We do not want a world where any company or any country has produced the average ethics in a blender that we try to fine tune. Ask Elon how Grok is going trying to make his AI unwoke. It's not working that well. Why? Because it's hard to tune these things because they hallucinate their own stuff. Because what's bias is in there is already in there. And you have to perform all these magic tricks to try to get it wrong. So is it going to be a little bit racist? Yeah, because the web's a little bit racist. Is it going to be a little bit sexist? Yeah, it's going to be a little bit sexist. All of the problems that we have, the things that we love and hate about the data on the World Wide Web, the information that we've produced, some of our best and some of our worst of ourselves is all there. But that's not all of us, and that's not you. So the entire concept of a monolithic approach to artificial intelligence, we believe is the exact wrong approach. What you need is intelligence at the edge. Your agent, your data, right? And your ethics, your bias. What we want in any democracy is a marketplace of bias. We want lots of bias, all kinds of bias, all kinds of different ethical perspectives. And then we test the fitness of our ideas with each other, right? And in collectives, we vote on these things to, to determine what we want. And then what? We learn what works and doesn't work, and we adapt. But today, we're looking at AI systems by the world's leaders in the space who are making AIs that don't adapt, that are monolithic data systems, that are trying to basically produce the average ethics in a blender. You cannot do ethics after the fact this way. You can't do alignment after the fact this way. And you can't do governance after the fact this way. And so it's critically important that we start to think of, like we're doing at Versus, developing ways of de creating intelligent agents that are yours, right? that you can basically put your data into, that you can control that data and how it's used. You can control how it's monetized. That can learn and adapt the way that you learn and adapt, become augmentations of our capabilities, and then connect it together. We have this collective debate about where we want to take the world and what kind of ethics apply. Not all ethics apply in all situations. We, we, we know this very well. So I, the whole concept of AI ethics is, to me, very backwards. It's just ethics, and we don't want AI ethics. We want our ethics, and we want to be able to, to share these together in what I think is a, you know, an entirely distributed architecture, much more like the web and much less like AOL or any of the centralized portals that try to, hey, these are the only websites you can go to. This is how we started. So I believe that the future is just about ethics and bias, and we all have it. So let's all bring it to the table and have the, have the discussions, have the dialectic, and learn from each other. So I believe that that's the shift that, that we need to move forward with in 2024. I appreciate your answer. Oh, go ahead, Nicole. 
I, I, just, I just have a question for this because I mean, I, I really like, I buy into this decentralized concept and the way you, you, you talked about it totally. I'm just also kind of seeing us in, in this um, increasingly fragmented world where I feel like the bar of what is acceptable is kind of sinking, right? I feel like we're punching lower and lower. So I just wonder how, how do you think about this in this marketplace, right? Um, and I'm, I have trust and I'm optimistic in principle <laughs> as humans, um, but you know, there are minorities we need to protect. There are things, you know, voices that are not as loud as others. So I'm just kind of wondering how this, how this fits in. That, that for me would be sort of the minimum. We have to agree like, okay, we're, we're punching somewhere here, and, but it's, it's kind of above a certain line. Yes, thank you for asking that. Um, if you make an AI system that's based on a monolithic data set that tries to learn the world and apply what it learns from the past to the future, but only learns from the past, uh, which is every AI system we're basically talking about today in terms of gen generative AI and deep learning, this is why this is why we can't get to autonomous cars. They, they, they make mistakes because what isn't in the training data, it can extrapolate. It, there is no magic, there is no emergence. It's, it is amazing and maybe the most world's most amazing engineering feat, but if we trained it on data 200 years ago, I think slavery was a good idea, right? And so if you have a monolithic system that is trying to average out whatever the dominant perspectives were in any given culture, it doesn't allow for that culture to grow and adapt, doesn't allow for minority voices to emerge. So you have to have a system that can enable more diverse voices and adapt and change as that goes, which we, we have done as a culture, right? And there's, there's, there's a, a much longer road to go, but I don't think that's the vehicle that can take us there. It has to come from us and it has to basically be authentic to us. And if we don't have adaptation in these systems, which by the way, just so we're super clear, that's what intelligence is. If you can't adapt to a new situation, you're not intelligent in that situation. So your old intelligence doesn't apply. Then that is every system we're talking about. What we're developing at Versus, based on cognitive architectures of how the, how the mind works, how, how biological intelligence works, enables agents to adapt. And so as a society, we have to adapt. So we need to build that adaptation and emergence and support that in the system itself. We can't just take it from the average of whatever the history was before. So I think that this supports and enables and encourages change. And that's what we need. I'll just add one thing to all that discussion. You know, it's like there's also something pragmatic we have to start very early on. Educating people on the exposure. For example, you know, it's like in, in my domain, we have satellites that are going to go up and take pictures of Earth all the way from 500 kilometers with a spatial resolution of 10 centimeters that's coming. That's, that's a lot of detail, wow. right? And there's nothing, I mean, like, there's no privacy there, to be very honest, because anyone can do that. So um, educating people on the level of exposure is, is a very good starting point in getting to these discussions we are talking about. So uh, we are trying to do that. You know, we are trying to show those examples of how things will look like uh, through our platforms and, and uh, educate people on the level of exposure on these things as well. That's, that's what we feel as our contribution to contributing to the ethics discussion. Can, can I comment on that? So how many people in the room feel good about that idea that we're gonna have 10 centimeter accuracy from how many feet? 500, 500 kilometers. 500 kilometers. I mean, it's gonna help us with global warming. It's gonna help us be, be able to track all, all kinds of stuff, right? But, but but at some level, privacy becomes the number one issue, right? Here's a question that we don't ask ourselves. What does digital enforcement look like? Exposure is great. Being aware that it's happening, having conversations about it. How do you stop it from happening? Or if it's happening, how do you determine who gets access to that data and under what terms they can do it? In what law-abiding ways can we ensure enforcement? And so this is part of what we need standards for. We need socio-technical standards that enable governments to be, governance to be automated for data rights to be automated. And if it's not, you get to shoot it out of the sky. You can't just put a satellite up there and spy on everybody, right? We, we've, we've done this with the web. Everyone remember when there was just HTTP and anyone could do anything? We said, oh, let's add certificates. So HTTPS, so we have security, we have TLS certificates, we can authenticate wh who's, oh, is it not Bank of America? Oops, they took my money. We don't want the same thing in the physical world. So we want to apply the lessons we have learned from large network architectures, the largest in the world, 
to these issues. A lot of ethics comes down to what behaviors can or cannot be done. But if we're merely aware of them, but don't like them, but we can't digitally enforce them, a bunch of Congress people saying it's illegal is not going to do anything. We need digital enforcement at the network layer in the data itself. And I think these are the new kinds of standards. If we want to get the benefits of those that raise their hands, and so you know, this can really help us tackle global challenges, let's have the best of both worlds. Look, uh, I want to thank our panelists. I, I can really talk to you and ask you questions for another five hours. It's fascinating listening to each of you. Um, but I won't ask. I'll just thank you, and I won't ask more questions. I want to see if we give the audience the chance to ask you two questions um, before we close it up for the day. Right behind you. Catch ball. And if you could tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're coming from, speak into the microphone because they're recording it, um, and then ask your question briefly, please. I speak here? Yes. yes. OK, nice. So can you hear me well? <laughs> OK, yeah, so thanks a million for, for the panel. It was very insightful. I really loved it. And on my end, I'm a strategic account executive at Salesforce. And of course, we're investing a lot into AI. We're now also starting to look at XR. So in parallel to Salesforce, I'm leading the VR AR Association in Switzerland. And I'm very curious about your thoughts or your input in regards to, okay, how a company like Salesforce should actually adapt towards uh, XR customer experiences. Because what we're seeing is that our customers, customers today are not actually as much present as we would like to into XR channels. So do you believe the go-to-market approach should be rather a hybrid with desktop or a mobile device first and then adapting towards XR space with headsets or, or uh, glasses, as we're seeing now uh, in the hardware space? or what would be your thoughts on, on that end? And maybe uh, Alex or, or Gabriel, you have some inputs around that. I'll try to briefly answer it, um, and then we can go to another question. I think the thing the world is missing is not devices, it's solutions. Um, and people that actually can marry you know, technical experts with people in different industries that can provide you with the insight. I think ultimately it's a mistake um, to just use this new category of products in the same way as the old category of products. Because at the end of the day, you know, entropy matters and you already have the old products. I think you have to leverage and create experiences that net out just cannot be done with the other devices to answer your question of do you create hybrids. Uh, I think that the, one of the key unlocks in this space is collaborative computing. It's the idea that if you think about all other devices that you use today, Try to collaborate with someone on anything that you're exploring. It's single person, single device, single experience. Collaboration is not really there. Um, so I think one of the key benefits of taking content away from devices and placing content over the real world is to be able to get people around the table, is able to have people collaborating, having conversations, and at that point, achieving things with technology that you simply have not been able to do before. And you know, with enough of those solutions in given industries, you know, this thing goes from science fiction um, into mainstream. One last question, if we can, right there, please. Thanks, bro. All right, thanks, uh, Mirza from Toronto, Canada. Um, it's a take, maybe on Gabe and, and Nicole, but it's for any of you uh, about data sovereignty. Right? And it ultimately comes down to data privacy. And yes, by extrapolation, enforcement. Right, Gabe, how do you enforce that? So what do we do as builders? Are we the ones, aside from shipping product, are we the ones that then go to the masses and say, hey, know your rights around your own data, your own private and personal data, if we are going to extrapolate maybe 10, 20 years from now, do we then charter a, a data bill of rights, right? Or do we work with government and say a government, every government needs a chief AI, AI officer so that they can inform then the citizens of that country to say, you know, this is already happening. Do you know? In a session I was in earlier, Interestingly enough, in the U.S. If I can I just no speed idea. you up on the question. Yeah, yeah we're no, running I'll, out of time. I'll, I'll, Alex, I'll just end it here. But it's a really valid point, and I think it's, it's worth knowing for everyone. In the U.S., your post box is protected under a privacy law, right. but your DNA is not. Right. Thank you. you. Thank you. So I'll, I'll just be brief. Um, data ownership. 
If you want privacy, you want sovereignty, it has to be owned. So, but you can't go to governments and say, whenever we say, people say all the governments in the world, then forget whatever they say after that because it's not, they can't, we can't get everyone to agree. The one thing that works that no one pays any attention to is standards. Global standards that are powering every device in this room, powering these lights, powering these microphones, they are the things that are the quiet infrastructure underneath that we all run on. Engineers and scientists agree, doesn't matter who the prime minister is, doesn't matter who's in Congress, this happens based on does it work or does it not work. We need it at the standards level. Groups like IEEE and ISO need to be leading the charge. They are, we're working with them now. This then allows us to then have different kinds of decisions around data privacy and data sovereignty in different governments and different regions while enabling interoperability, just like we can bring our devices and our plugs here and get little adapters when we roll in. Then both the humans, the sensors, the robots, the devices can all use data in that same way. And we can do this experiment where we learn better and better ways of maintaining our data ownership, our sovereignty, our privacy, and interoperability. And I believe that that opens up this new world that we're looking for. Thank you all. Big round of applause for our panelists today. Thank you.